Hello team and welcome back to another episode on the Live, Perform, Compete podcast. I'm joined once again by my brother, my colleague, my friend, Ant Haynes. Ant Haynes, welcome. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Today we're doing a very similar format to what we did last time, Ant. We uh, we took some listener Q&As related to the topic of training and we're going to work our way through it. Today I've selected six questions from my lovely Instagram subscribers, went through the archives here to pick the best ones, uh, deliberately picked some conversations uh, that I think we can sink our teeth into a little bit more uh, and just kind of do what we did last time, which is a bit of back and forth um, and sharing kind of our experiences, our opinions, both as athletes and coaches, and hopefully provide you guys as listeners with some insight. So no time gap, but we're going to try and get us done in under 45 minutes. I said that last time and I think it went for an hour and a half. So you live and you learn. Let's see how we go. Question number one, what is the idea behind the sustainable and repeatable aerobic work that you often prescribe? Um, well, I think we, the first thing we should do is probably give an example of it. Um, the first example, I, I guess, is if this is someone coming from your Instagram, it would be the example of sustainable work that we do on the process programming, for example, on a Tuesday, um, something like um, three to six alternating sets of um, something like a row or a salt bike into some sort of mixed modal fitness, let's say burpees and dumbbell snatches. And then the other pairing of movements might be a row or a salt bike again, followed by a box jump and a toaster bar, something like that. Mm. So the idea of, of what we're looking for as coaches before we talk about why we program it is you're looking for consistency throughout the six sets, um, especially within the sport. You obviously see people go out really hot, complete a round in three minutes, and suddenly their final round is six minutes long. Um, so we're looking for consistency whether that is four and a half minutes across all your sets. Um, we're also looking for sustainability as well. So, you know, when you look at athletes, you see people start nice and stoic in their first round and suddenly by their last round, they're grimacing and they're doing everything they can just to try and hold that pace. Even if they are consistent with the pace, they're probably not sustainable with it. So those are two things that we look for as well. And I guess I'll let you go into the side of the programming for it, for the process programming. Yeah, nice. Okay, good start. So I think you know, what Ant's saying there is that we use the term sustainable and repeatable when we're referring to typically aerobic training. So it's probably not something we're going to use really with strength training. Um, so what, what do we mean by aerobic training? We'll kind of think about metabolic conditioning. Uh, so like Ant said, what does sustainable and repeatable mean? It means really that you know when you finish your last set of whatever the sets were prescribed in the work, or if it was an AMRAP, you, know, you finish the end of your AMRAP, and it means that you shouldn't be lying on your back or you shouldn't be gasping for air and you shouldn't not be able to do another round or another few minutes at the pace that you are holding. So when you do anything that's sustainable and repeatable, repeatable means when you finish the work, if we said go again now, you'd be able to go again and hit the same pace. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the sustainable part is, you know, your times typically because when we're doing conditioning, it's usually measured in time or sometimes in repetitions. If you're doing interval-based work, for example, like a set number of rounds, uh, then each round, the time taken to complete or the reps completed it in each round, it should be exactly the same. That's what we're defining as sustainable and repeatable. So the reason why we often use this as a training prescription, and I think it's important to put that word training in, is because when it comes to developing the aerobic system in general, it's really important that we're accumulating good quality work. When we talk about accumulating, it means putting in enough training volume uh, over the year and the accumulation of that good training volume is actually what allows us to be better. So maybe in an example, when we talk about weight training as if, you know, if we want to get stronger at the squat, we talked about this on our last podcast and, and we do most of our work at sub maximal loads, right? So we're doing sets of five sets of four sets of three, not working to failure every single set, leaving something in the tank and making sure we get through all our working sets. And then that intensity just kind of increases over time. The same concept goes for developing aerobic capacity. If we just take every single aerobic session that we do and go to failure, and what we mean by that in aerobic training is you're pushing so hard and going so fast right from the start that you're getting to the point where you're forced to rest. Not optional rest, but you're forced to rest because you just can't go anymore. That is the same idea of just doing a max out set every time you back squat 
and going to failure. And so what starts to happen if you do that all the time with your aerobic training, it's actually something called fatigue-based training. So you kind of alluded to it just there. And most people, when they do their aerobic training, they start really, really fast. And then halfway through the piece, their output starts to drop off. And by the end of each piece, they're kind of uh, forced into like a crawling or a very slow walking pace where they're resting a lot and moving a lot slower than they did at the start of the workout. And so if you look at that, that idea of fatigue-based training, let's make an example here. Let's say it's a 10-minute AMRAP of work. Or let's say it's a 20-minute AMRAP of work. And the first 10 minutes, they're working at a sustainable pace. And in the second half, they start to drop off because it just went too hard. So in that 20 minutes, they only really got 10 minutes of good quality training. The second 10 minutes was just wasted training where they were just, it was really just about survival. And so if every time they do their aerobic training, they're doing this kind of, they're having this approach where they're just pushing really, really hard to start and then dying off, the actual amount of accumulated good quality volume is considerably less versus if they were to just work at a slower pace and actually you know, accumulate all that good quality volume through being sustainable and repeatable. And so it's important that we, that we, you know, we said it at the start, this, is, this refers to training. So when we're trying to improve one's capacity, we're not just testing them all the time, right? We're not just doing a 1K row all out or a, or a 2K row all out. We're doing, you know, sub-maximal pieces working, you know, maybe 1K at a 65, 75, 85% effort. Um, and yeah, and that's, you know, that's how we're going to, when it comes to competition time, when it comes to game day, when we want to go all out, when we say to our athletes or as an athlete, you think, okay, this is not about pacing. This is just like a go workout, push as hard as I can, see how long I can hold on. The ability to do that effectively on game day is a result of all that sub-maximal work. So we use the term sustainable and repeatable to try to remind people that this is not a test or you're trying to go to failure. Pull back and leave something in the tank. Yeah, I think, I think something to add on what you just said. I think um, the people who are subscribers to Process Program will see this almost every single day with the way that we program. But um, for people that aren't part of the Process Programming is when you are following a group program and there's a certain amount of repetitions or certain amount of calories or meters to complete within a certain time frame, like we do in CrossFit generally, it becomes really hard to then know how to break up. Let's say you've written... Normally, it would just say 20 to let's say 500 meter row, 20 toes to bar, 20 burpees, rest 90 seconds, repeat, sustainable, repeatable. Now, what we want to do, like you said before, is try and make everything aerobic. It is aerobic based training and really the sport of CrossFit, it's an endurance sport. So as much as possible, we want to make every movement that we do, whether it's barbell cycling, rowing, burpees, double unders, box jumps, dumbbell cycling. We want to make it as aerobic as possible. So like you said, good quality reps, you try and encourage the athletes to breathe through it, to understand how, how they're feeling, to understand where their thresholds are. Do they need to break once in a set of 20? Maybe you don't even prescribe a load. You don't even prescribe a rep scheme. You say somewhere between 10 to 20 reps, choose a load that you're going to be able to stay consistent with. So you put the kind of onus upon the athlete to create the correct stimulus. And a lot of the time for the first two to four weeks, athletes won't get the right stimulus and they'll go that 22.5 kg dumbbell that I always see in the open. It actually ate me up today. So maybe the coach will then say, maybe let's go to a 17.5 and a 20. Let's work the transition where it's, you know, it's swapping in the air for the dumbbell snatch, for example, and you work the skill work on breathing. Where can you breathe overhead? Do you breathe and then you're not holding the dumbbell? Whatever it might be, but you understand how to slow the movement down to keep it aerobic for yourself as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we do sustainable and repeatable aerobic work every single week and we have done, you know, we've been in the sport for a long time now, seven, eight years, and still sometimes we'll get it wrong. I'll admit like, I think last our last aerobic Tuesday, two weeks ago, I got it completely wrong. Uh, but it's because also, you know, the combinations of movements in, this, in the sport cross in particular are always changing. Uh, so it does make the pacing element really challenging. I guess those who are good pacers just tend to have a lot of experience and will be able to look at a new fresh stimulus they've never done before, get an idea very quickly of how it's going to feel and where they need to make adjustments to pacing to ensure that it does stay sustainable and repeatable. But, you know, I got it completely wrong. And I probably think about this stuff more than most. 
uh, and I can't remember what the workout was. I think it was devil presses, wall balls, and rowing or assault bike. And I got, assault bike, yeah. yeah, I got my pace massively wrong from the start. And for the first time in a really long time, I had a really big drop off in my paces. So, you know, I think we, we talked a lot about the sport of CrossFit here. But if you're someone who does aerobic training, perhaps you, you're, you know, a distance runner or you compete in rowing or you're, you're in swimming or in a multi-event like a, like a triathlon or Ironman, the same concept still, still, still applies, you know, in your training as you're leading up to event or it's in the off season or you're a long way away from your competition, you know, pretty much the majority of your aerobic training should be kept sub-maximal and using those ideas those terms sustainable and repeatable a good uh good things to remind you as to how it should feel Correct. okay next question auto regulation and self-regulation with strength training please explain the advantages and disadvantages okay i think we've got to start with a definition here so auto regulation and self-regulation so auto regulation is uh, if you're happy for me to start, Ant, I can run yeah, with this. Go for it. So auto regulation is a training protocol that will sometimes prescribe to people, um, and the whole concept of auto regulation is basically uh, allowing the athlete to work given what they have to give on that day. Uh, so the the idea behind this is not every day is a day where we're able to hit a new personal best. Some days we feel good. Some days we feel tired. Sometimes weights feel heavy. Some days weights feel light. There are a million different contributing factors as to why that might happen. But I know if you're in a training space, you've definitely experienced this at some point. And so the idea of just giving ourselves percentages, for example, weightlifting often will prescribe percentages. You know, set one, 65%, set two, 70%, set three, 80%. And it means that the athlete is then put under pressure to have to hit a certain load, regardless of how they're feeling on that day. Uh, and that often leads, leads to issues. For example, you know, lifting loads that their body's not primed for in a day, uh, potential um, issues with things like overtraining or overloading. Uh, or similarly, you know, some people are following linear progressions where their weights are written down for them. You know, well, I hit 60 kilograms last week. Today, I have to hit 65. Or I hit 100 kilograms on a squat last week. This week, I have to hit 105. And so the principle is really good there because, you know, we're always striving for progression and the way that we get stronger is that we overload the loads that we lift. And that's really important. Uh, but only if it, if it was only that easy, if it was only a matter of just adding one kilogram every week until eventually you hit your target load, you know, we'd all be lifting a lot of weight if that was the case. Um, so what auto regulation is, is basically getting rid of the idea of percentages, getting rid of the idea of preset weights and basically just, you know, lifting on the day and whatever you have to give, that's all good. So maybe we can give some examples. Uh, I mean, we programmed and uh, on Monday, uh, auto regulation protocol for the back squat. Do you remember what that was? Yeah. Uh, if you were in the perform and compete group, we basically built to a tough set of three for the day. Now the, the three, firstly, is not a maximal three. It's a three where your positions are still intact. There's no compromise, you know, knees aren't coming in, the back's not caving. We're not really struggling and grinding out the hole. So you're like leaving one to two reps fresh in the tank. So you build to a heavy set of three. Um, if you're a female, you'll then take 90%. If you're a male, you'll take 85% of that heavy set of three and you're doing AMRAP set based upon the heavy three you hit. And we basically do the AMRAP set. Firstly, A, you do it according to tempo. So the tempo is two seconds down, straight back up with a one second break at the top where you could breathe and brace and go again. If you can no longer maintain the tempo, you terminate the set. If for some reason we lose positions, uh, we terminate the set or, you know, it just becomes a maximal lift and you can no longer do another rep, then you terminate the set just before failure. Um, yeah, so we got some, I mean, it, it's cool because it's the second week already that we're doing that. We're already seeing some good progressions from there. Um, and people also enjoy having the opportunity to do that sort of thing as well. Yeah, so I think that that is a great example of auto-regulation in two elements. Number one, build to a heavy set of three. So we're not saying build to a three rep max, which often creates the perception that I need to go heavier than last time I did a three rep, right? So we're just saying build to a heavy three based on what you have today. There should be no loss of position or form. And so straight away, you know, you're removing 
past experiences or past loads that you've hit with that movement. And it's just, all right, well, let's just see what my body has to give today. So immediately there's step one with the auto regulation. And then step two, take a percentage of that load and do as many reps as you can. So again, like, okay, well, this is all you had to give on this day for your heavy set of three. Let's work with that percentage versus let's work with preset percentages based on a one rep max that you hit nine months ago that you're nowhere near right now. Um, which is, I think, you know, what a lot of the weightlifting and, and training world gets sucked into. So that yeah. is auto-regulation. That's probably a good definition. Self-regulation. So self-regulation, really, we're kind of defining that as, as you as the individual taking responsibility and making changes to your program or to your training session based on how you feel on the day. Uh, so, uh, for example, you know, if I was to prescribe ant, uh, squat snatch, uh, build to uh, a triple for the day, and ants then warming up and just the squatting position isn't feeling good for whatever reason. Maybe he had a workout the day before that's kind of hindering his hips or maybe just feels fatigued, maybe just feels tight. Ant would then make the call in the moment, okay, I'm going to adjust this to a power snatch where I'm not going into my full squat. That is an example of Ant self-regulating his own workout. And also maybe he just feels a bit tired rather than building to a heavy three for a day. I'm just going to build to... Uh, or I'm just going to do three sets of three at light to moderate load because I don't feel like going for something heavy today. Again, an example of, of Ant taking responsibility of self-regulating his workout. Self-regulation can be the exercise. So you change the exercise. It can be the sets. It can be the reps. It can be the intensity. Uh, I mean, it, you can basically self-regulate. The stimulus, yeah. stimulus can completely change if you want it. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's the definition of auto-regulation and self-regulation. Um Let's talk about auto-regulation first and let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. You want to start with advantages? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess we'll, I mean, we, we're talking obviously a, in an individual, but also a, a like a group avatar space as well. I think it's especially beneficial in a group avatar one when you may not have so much like contact time with an athlete and when you can prescribe auto-regulation I think the advantage on a group program especially is um, there's a little bit of like a, a psychological relief, you know, when, like you said, if you're prescribed, you have to hit 89% of your one rep max, whatever lift today. If you got a range, you got to hit, Hey, why don't you hit today? Let's go like anywhere between 80 to 90% where we know it's like a, something that they have been working through to the, over the last few weeks even though they should probably be able to hit 90% this week, you know, we, we don't take into account yet people's sleep, people's nutrition, things that may be going on outside the gym, um, other stresses they might have. So just allowing that kind of auto-regulation just allows people to have a little bit of psychological relief and don't beat themselves up because, you know, who doesn't want to progress and who doesn't want to get better. So just allowing people that kind of um, to take their foot off the gas a little bit. Yeah, exactly. You take the pressure away from them. Um, like you said as well, uh, the idea of auto-regulation, if people understand that the stimulus might be able to change or the movement might be able to change, there's no point in digging deeper when something might be niggling in the body. Like you said, you know, hips aren't feeling great, but the coach is telling me I've got to go ask the grass or hit a full depth back squat. The idea of auto-regulation is maybe, you know, you, you give the option within the, within the program. And I know it's something we definitely do on the process program, like the build program as well you give people the option maybe you go to a box squat today and you stay out of depth in that position again so you're not only helping them psychologically but you're also obviously helping them physically as well i think um an individual basis again i mean i i look at i mean we look at people in hong kong who are got a million different things going on in their lives every single day um i think it's important then as well you know you you listen to people you can get it you can get better idea of of how people are feeling the day and you have more contact time with people. So it makes it a little bit easier to help them with their auto regulation. Like some people will love a number on the board or a number on their, on their training program. They love it. And you know, no matter what they're going to hit it. Um, and sometimes I can put yourself into a deeper hole, you know, like I'm especially someone who can, if I see 90%, I'll bite, you know what? It doesn't matter. If I see 90%, I'm going to just keep going until I hit that 90%. And once I hit it once, even if it's a sloppy as hell rep, take the box, move on. Um, so, you know, that, that immediately can put you into a deeper hole as well, especially if you're doing like hard, heavy aerobic training as well. 
you're suddenly being told you got to hit a certain pace and your assault bike can do a certain amount of unbroken reps and be hitting a certain time, you're going to be putting yourself deep down into a bigger hole later on, which is harder to get out of. Mm. Um, I mean, those are the three main ones for me. And I guess, all, of course, those three group ones can play across into the individual as well. But I think individual, as you would probably say as well, is much easier to manage people when the transparency is there and people are open and honest and they feel like they have a space to communicate with the coach and the athlete, vice versa. You can communicate with each other and uh, be totally honest. And I think it is definitely a stigma against, you know, saying to your coach, Hey, actually, I feel a bit run down today. Or like, I can't quite get into this right position. I should be in. It's not like, let's be fine. I'll grip my teeth and I'll just kind of push through and get through it. I know I'm definitely guilty of that in the past for sure. Um, but yeah, learning to let go of that and be a little bit more vulnerable and just be like, Hey, I'm not actually feeling it today. Would you mind changing it? You know, people feel like a hassle sometimes, but it's not at all. You much rather, we always look for longevity within what we do. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's probably a safer and better route to go down as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think, um, I think the ego is the enemy when it comes to a lot of people who don't get auto regulation quite right. Uh, yeah. because you know, they have this attachment to the past and they have this attachment to wanting to hit a certain number uh, and probably the feeling that they're getting less fit if they don't hit the number. And I completely get it. I can understand that from a psychological standpoint. But, you know, just the more you can understand the body isn't at 100% every day. Sometimes the body's not at 100% and you're not going to know why. There are just some days where you think you're going to have a good training session because everything seems to be aligned and you end up having maybe the worst training session of your week. Um, so yeah, I think I do agree on all those things. You know, the, the concept of auto regulation is like, is perfect. Give your body what it wants. And that's, you know, that's enough. And you, you're okay with that move on. And that's how we get better in the long term. And like you said, it's one of the biggest missing pieces when it comes to longevity, I think, but the disadvantages are that, you know, you even said it yourself, you've been training for pretty much your whole entire life and you still sometimes got it wrong. And I think it's really important to understand that to, to effectively, um, adhere to auto regulation protocols, you need to be experienced. You yeah. need to be experienced in a sense that you need to know, for example, if the program or the coach is asking you to leave two perfect reps in the tank, a lot of people have no idea where that threshold is. And especially if you're a little bit new, newer to training, you know, you think that <laughs> you think that your reps may look perfect, but they're actually a long way off just simply because you're not really sure what perfect looks like perhaps because you haven't yeah. just been exposed to the movement enough. Uh, you know, similarly, you know, prescribe an AMRAP set and some people just don't really know where their threshold is, where their limits are. So they keep them going or they stop way too early and don't get, you know, the, the intended stimulus. So I definitely sure. think that auto regulation, auto regulated protocols are a really good thing on paper, but need to be prescribed correctly to the individual uh, or yeah. the group. So, you know, for our training groups, we only really give it to the more experienced athletes who are in the training groups. So for us, it's kind of like the perform, compete and the build program um and if with individuals definitely not going to give it to someone like mum who you know doesn't really can't really grasp the concept or isn't aware really of what like moderate versus hard versus really hard versus extremely hard training feels like you know she can't really yeah. discern the difference because it just hasn't really been training for long enough so yeah i think that's probably the biggest disadvantage of also regulated training would you agree with that yeah for sure as well i think obviously especially with the way the world is now, everyone gets a bit, you know, touchy feely a little bit sometimes. And I think people obviously, they know training is supposed to be hard. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you, all that sort of stuff, same, same. But people can definitely go too far to the other side and every day suddenly becomes an auto-regulated day. And it depends what space you're in. If you're training for life, then that's fine. But if you're talking about someone that's competitive in the sport, you know, it's a, it's a really hard gray area in the middle of when do you push and you follow the higher percentage or when do you need to self-regulate yeah. and auto-regulate and follow that. So like you said, it's just down to experience as well um, and understanding your body. I'm sure people who have been training for five plus years have always have all been in that hole where suddenly they've lost a bit of motivation. They've lost the energy. They're smashing two or three extra coffees or caffeinated beverages to try and get them up for training. Suddenly they're losing sleep. The appetite's a little bit worse and all they really needed was to just back off a couple of days prior just so the body could freshen up and get back into it. But we've all been there. And like you said, it's just experience and you kind of have to live and learn to, to even get that experience in the first place.
Yeah, cool. All right, so then let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of self-regulation. I mean, I think it's kind of the same stuff. You know, Similar, I think it, yeah. it's a matter of experience. You know, experienced athletes or experienced trainees will know when to push and when to pull back uh, through prior previous experience. Uh, those who are a little bit newer might need a bit more handholding. Uh, and, you know, then as a coach, it, it, yes, it's definitely more work as a coach, but it's, it's very essential, you know, and understanding each week or every day almost where your athlete is at and what they have to give and then being able to self-regulate on behalf of that athlete. I mean, I certainly find work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I had a client today um, who came in uh, and we snatch on a Wednesday uh, and I could just tell the moment he picked the bar up and we put it over his head and he did his first overhead squat, I could tell it was just going to be a good snatch day. Uh, just in like his facial expressions, how fluid he was moving, you know, it's normally a bit of a tight position for him. Um, but he was able to just put the bar over his head and drop into, you know, an astagrass squat. And I said, how do you feel today? And he said, I feel great. I said, how was your sleep? You know, just a, a quick, quick check-in. How's your sleep? How's your stress? How are you feeling right now? You know, all green ticks. And straight away, so, you know, made some manipulations to the program. All right, today, you know, last week we were a bit submaximal, folks a bit more in technique. I think today we've got to push a little bit more. You know, let's strike when the iron's hot. You look like you're moving well. You feel good. You look great. Let's push it. And yeah. so, you know, on behalf of him, kind of made the self-regulations for him. Uh, you know, and sometimes it will be, you know, that question and answer at the start of a session, maybe with someone like yourself. It's like, you know, how are you feeling today? Mm, you know, not feeling great. I think I'm going to actually just kind of modify this bit and change the intensity a bit here, take the loads a bit lighter here. And, you know, so then in that case, you're self-regulating yourself. What I will say when you work with groups online or people remotely as a coach um, who are, you know, you don't get the, the ability to see them face to face in person every day, definitely is a lot more challenging. And I think to get people to self-regulate effectively really just comes down to education. Uh, and just, you know, constant reminding on what the principles of self-regulation are and how to know, you know, where they're at on a particular day. If you have things like the whoop band or, you know, you're, you're tracking HRV somehow or you're monitoring your sleep or you keep a journal, all those kind of things are really useful tools to help someone become more aware as to what they have to give on a day. And then, you know, as a coach, you can provide them with, with adjustment options based on how they're feeling. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Next question, programming for someone two days a week versus three days a week versus four days a week. How do you structure the days differently for someone trying to get strong and build muscle? Sure. Um, Take it off. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, of course, it de depends a lot on training age and what they've done in the past. Um, but, I mean, that's just a regular answer. We could give everything. It, it does depend. Um, so... Yeah, age of age of the individual, um, obviously like the job and the stresses around what they're doing. Um, but generally, if we, we let's take like the perfect scenario, if someone sleeps eight hours a week, they're pretty lean already and they're no they're injuries, high charge, no issues, no injuries, yeah, no, we're sweet. Um, if we're going twice a week, we're probably going to hit them with two total body sessions, um, assuming they're going to be spaced at least two to three days apart from each other. Obviously, if we're going back to back, it's a little bit different. Um, but hopefully, you'd space them one at the beginning of the week, one towards the tail end of the week. You do a total body session, something like an A1, A2, followed by a B1, B2, possibly a C1, C2, if it allows hitting the main the main groups, your push pulls, your squats, your deadlifts, um, probably a little bit of midline uh, stability work built in there. Um, but yeah, I think both sessions will follow a very similar pattern. Your big heavy compound movements to start followed by some like accessory push and pull which will be different to the vertical horizontal version on the opposite days if that makes sense yes okay so i completely agree and yeah. why would you go with two total body sessions versus for example an upper body and a lower body split or like a more conventional bodybuilding split like a biceps tries Back and, and bicep sort of yeah thing. exactly uh yeah i mean at of course, you can still go on that split. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, just with the way that, I mean, I guess that I've been brought up and, and learned about it. It just allows, again, for you to be able to do, hopefully, like two days of knee flexion work versus just one huge day when you smash yourself. Let's say you're doing this. Let's say we go a squat day, 
uh, let's say we go leg day and a upper body day, for example, and you just completely hammer um, either or. Um, obviously, it can leave you incredibly sore that so you can't can't continue pushing on that day. You also have a seven day or six day window before you get back to that muscle group again. Depending on how hard you push and how much recovery you need between those sessions, I doubt you're going to be smashing someone into oblivion if they're only going to be training twice a week. Um, so yeah, I would I would do something like let's say a squat with a pull and then a hinge movement with a push for your A1, A2, B1, B2. And I would actually basically when I go, let's say we go Monday to Friday, I would basically flip them around. Then my A1, A2 becomes my <clears throat> my push and my hinge. And then my B1, B2 becomes my knee flexion or squatting exercise and my pulling work. So it just allows you to still attack the two, but you're still getting all four of those main movers, your push, pull, your squat, and your hinge. It allows them to stay fairly fresh. On one day, you can charge hard at the A2, A1 and A2, and then be a little bit, <clears throat> sorry, something kind on of my voice here. <coughs> and you can go a little bit easier on the B1, B2, and we flip it around the other way around. You can attack the B work, which is now the A, and then the A work can be some more supplementary work. Like I said, you've got the option of working vertical versus horizontal, pulling and pushing, single leg versus double leg, depending on where they are as an athlete. And it just gives you loads of room to progress as well, nice. rather than just smashing one thing the whole time. You're just going to back squat and then front squat and then do some sort of hack squat and then do some sort of lunge. You're literally going to be in hospital the next day, so sore, and probably still wouldn't even be recovered come six days later because you're still going to be sore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it just gives a lot of variety in the program, keeps things a little bit more exciting uh, and allows you to push and pull back when you need to as well. Yeah, I think the, the biggest takeaway there is that, you know, if you're only training two week, two days a week, you just need more frequent touches on, on muscle groups and body parts. And yeah. just by doing big splits, you're just not going to get enough exposure to really progress. Okay, yeah. so what about for someone who's training three days a week? I think I'll here you got... Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll jump in here. I think three days a week, you've just got a little bit more leeway. Now this is a potential, as soon as someone's training three days a week, you can start to explore with different types of training splits. So, you know, again, depending on where your days are split throughout the week, if you got a clean, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which would probably be optimal than having two days of recovery, uh, just things to think about is that, you know, Monday is going to be typically your freshest day of training because you're coming out of a two day rest day. And that Friday is probably going to be a least fresh day because A, it's the end of the working week and you've already hit two training days before that. Uh, so that's your first thing to kind of consider. Um, you know, if you have those a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can play around with just three total body sessions. Again, still structured and split in a smart way that you're not just hitting the same muscle groups on the three days, but you're definitely kind of hitting a bit of everything. I think that would be for most people, a pretty good way to attack three days a week. Uh, of course, this is where you can actually start to explore kind of total body, uh, sorry, like more upper body, lower or kind of bodybuilding-esque type splits as well. So you could, for example, do something like a Monday lower body, Wednesday upper body, and then a Friday a total body, for example. Or you could go into the muscle groups uh, where you're actually working on like an, a two-week template. So you could go kind of upper body push, pull, lower body, um, on Wednesday and then like an arms on a Friday and then kind of just rotate into the next week. So then your fourth day training split could be uh, like abs or core, for example, and then you just repeat the cycle. So you're always kind of shifting around on a six day split on a four day split. I think there's just loads of different ways to do it. You really have as a coach or as someone who's programmed for themselves on three days, just a little bit more variety and you have a chance to kind of probably put a lot of different training programs in uh, and be successful. What I will say is that if your training days aren't split as evenly as a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example, maybe it's like a Monday, Tuesday, Friday, uh, then perhaps on a Monday, Tuesday, back-to-back -back days wouldn't be so wise to do two total body sessions. You could play with something like an upper body, lower body split there. So you're a, a and then, you know, you got a few days of rest before you hit maybe a total body session at the end of the week. But you know, I just think the main takeaway here is that you really have more options as soon as you start to play with three sessions a week or more. Anything to add? No, that's good. Cool. And I think the four day, four day week, um, again, is just kind of the same as the three day. You know, you can play with four total body sessions. You could play with four total body sessions, but each of the total body sessions 
has uh, kind of a bit more of a specific focus. So I know, you know, we currently have the build program, which we just released three weeks ago uh, on the process programming, which is just designed purely to get people strong and build muscle. There is no conditioning, uh, no Olympic lifting, no, no gymnastics. That was a massive shameless plug, but oh, well, I've done it now, can't retract. Uh, but those guys and girls are training four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They're doing upper and lower body work on every single day. But on their Mondays, they're doing lower body uh, quad bias work and upper body pulling bias work. Then on Tuesday, they're doing lower body posterior chain work and upper body anterior chain work. So pushing. And then it just basically repeats on a Thursday, Friday with different movements. So it, it does feel like for them, it will feel like they're doing a total body session every day. But the muscle groups are changing uh, on consecutive days. So they're not hitting the same muscle groups back to back. So it's still allowing them to, to kind of push in each training session. Yeah okay cool should we move on to the next one out okay what goes through your mind when you're programming for groups uh for example the process programming or like coastal fitness when you're programming for classes so why don't we just talk about here and they're just rather than going into everything let's just talk about like in bullet point fashion what are the things you have to think about if you are programming for a group Oh, you kick I mean, us off and I'll jump in. We'll just go back and forth. Yeah. So when you think about a group, obviously, first things first, you got to think about the space that they got. So you got to think about how much space they got, what equipment they got. Um, some spaces are weird. Luckily, we have a big square and rectangle that we can work with. So it's easy to coach with. Everything's in the middle. Some places you got weird shapes. You got to go around the corner. So it's hard for coaches to coach people. Like if everyone's doing Olympic lifting or squatting in a rack, for example. Um, next thing to think of is something that we we push hugely which is feedback from clients um you know feedback and we're so lucky that we have what up which is a great athlete tracking software that we can use um basically people log their scores after every single session and we are hammering that to people you know not only for the athlete's benefit but that helps us massively and we always encourage as many notes as possible throw them down there so we can see how you're feeling you know when you generally see people say Ass is still very sore from lunges on Monday and Sunday or on Thursday. Maybe you need to adapt the program here and there because you're looking at athlete feedback. So that's like our semi-individualized um, way yeah. of programming for us. Uh, let me just um, jump in there then real quick, just to kind of reiterate yeah. on that. Uh, you know, that is feedback for instance, from your group is really important. If your training program that you're writing is trying to cater to the needs of the group. I think there's a lot of programs out there which don't try to cater to the needs of the group and instead, you know, just write a general template of program out and they could do that, you know, nine weeks in advance and just put it out there for people to follow. Uh, but if you are interested in, in creating something for your people, then I think it's really important you do get feedback because at the end of the day, when you're training, when you're programming from a group, you're never going to satisfy everyone. That's the most important thing to think about. But it is really important that you're satisfying the majority. So your training has to be moving, has to be catering towards what people need for the majority of the group, not just an individual. Uh, so therefore, I think feedback is really important. So I just want to reiterate on back on this equipment you said at first, and yeah. you know, you obviously the program has to accommodate for the equipment available in the gym or what you have. You know, if you're programming an EMOM uh, of like a barbell movement and then a rower and then a box jump and then a rope climb and then a muscle up, and then a bench press, you know, you've got six different pieces of equipment there that you're going to need to have out in a room. It's not going to be realistic for a gym. Yeah. Uh, something I also think about, uh, cause I write a lot of group programs is just the flow of the workout, you know, trying to use the same equipment as much as you can, as you flow from A to B to C so that there isn't lost time where people are having to put stuff away and bring it back. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked I guess about on, yeah. on that goes as your 60 minute window as well, where you got to allow for, Mm -hmm. coach's explanation coach's warm-up athlete execution of whatever movement and then possibly repeating those steps two to three times through that workout and remaining within your 60 minute window as well yeah timing that's super important yeah uh what else what else are you thinking about when it comes to groups um i oh, think like one thing one thing that's really important as well especially with our program is the prescription of exercises as yeah. well you know like if we, you know when, when we first opened up coastal fitness for the first time I remember you and I, I remember I probably snatched only like 30 times ever. And I 
I'll be put my hand up right now and say I had no confidence in coaching anyone how to snatch. We had guys in there who'd done way more snatches than me. I could probably do more, but with what technical proficiency, probably absolutely zero. So, you know, I, I was really nervous of that. And really our clientele at the time didn't need to be snatching or doing heavy cleans anyway. So the prescription of it was like really simple work still because our clientele were all very new and they'd move with us from like an outdoor group style training suddenly into this environment where there's a barbell. You don't need to throw clean and jerks and snatches and bar muscle ups and stuff in there to start. It's a group clientele, you know, it was, we're all very, very, very new to CrossFit. So you're basically starting from scratch again. So yeah, yeah I, I guess I think something ability levels. I think something is really that goes hand in hand with the idea of ability levels is knowing the ability levels of your subscribers or, or of your group members. So I think this is where it gets tricky when you run, if you're writing a program for a really big group, uh, for example, like the old the typical CrossFit model was that there's a workout of the day uh, that is an RX workout. And if you can't complete the workout as it's prescribed, then you have to scale it. Uh, now that's obviously fairly easy to do i guess because you're only having to write one workout and just providing scaling options for everyone but as we know a scaling option often just doesn't replicate the rx Same movement stimulus. you know yeah. for example like snatching 60 kilograms if you're a male and if you can't do it you're going to do pvc pipe snatches this is not <laughs> the, the same thing uh, no matter how many pvc pipe snatches you're going to do it's never going to feel like snatching 60 kilograms uh, so i think you know if you can have if you have your group program set up into groups where, you know, there's prerequisites required. So, you know, to join each group, you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And that will at least give you as a programmer a better idea as to, okay, well, I know that everyone in my program who follows this program can do X, Y, and Z, which means I have full confidence in programming this knowing that they can complete it. Uh, and I think that is something, you know, we've done for sure at Coastal and the process of programming. And it certainly made life a lot easier knowing that I have full confidence that if I'm going to write something um, and it's relative to the group, I know they're going to be able to do it. And I think as someone yeah. who follows that program, you also have confidence in knowing that, well, I was able to meet the prerequisites. Therefore, I can probably do this. You know, yeah. not having that self-doubt or that shame and having to scale, which a lot of people feel, which is completely ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, the shame that people feel when they have to scale something and usually it's their ego that stops them scaling because they don't want to be that person who has to scale. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What well, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Everything we're covering in the group. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's it. I think, you know, just probably the last one is, you know, self-regulation, auto-regulation are really good training protocols to use when you're training groups because you're going to have a whole bunch of different, not only ability levels, but a whole bunch of different, uh, energy availability to give on to a day you know you may have half the group uh be having a, a tough day and not have much to give in the workout you may have the other half of the group feeling fantastic and really ready to push uh, but if you just prescribe one rep scheme uh with a prescribed load or percentage you know it's going to be the likelihood of you getting it right as a programmer is a little bit less the bigger your group so if you can yeah. give rep ranges or percentage ranges and then again educate your people on how to make the right choice themselves I think then that's how you're going to be really successful when you're pre for a yeah. group. So yeah, giving ranges would be good. Okay, cool. A few more questions to go. I'm just getting back into training and I'm sure I'm, and I'm unsure as to how many sessions a week are optimal. Any suggestions on where to start? Oh, I mean, it, again, it depends what program you're following and what, what you're looking to do. Um, I guess this is a very, um, this is a very relevant question for people who are like coming out of lockdowns or currently going into lockdowns and going to be facing that sort of thing. Um, I guess like if you're in lockdown, you know, you better, you just got body weight stuff to do. It's like, um, you'll be able to follow a program that really, like you said before, you can almost train every single day and just work your way around it and do something. Um, if you're following a program, I think there's something that we touched on before. If you, if you, if there's something that's being prescribed, whether it's individual or it's up on a group TV screen, you almost feel like obliged to have to do what it says on the TV screen. You know, if you've turned up to that day, you're like, oh, well, if everyone else is going to do it, I'm going to do it as well. So I guess the idea of auto and self-regulation comes into play here as well. Mm. Um, but I think, again, we spoke about it before with the, again, the regulation work is experience of the body, experience of the mind and leaning on what you have to give on that day. Um, I agreed on what you said before. There's absolutely no shame on like, whether it's scaling, whether it's 
not going to the gym and going for a walk instead because it's going to be better for your mind, body, and soul. You know, whether it is just taking it easy when you're in the gym and just doing something for quality versus pushing for the one rep max it says on the screen. Um, I think honestly, like you can you can get back into let's say you were doing five days a week, suddenly you are out, you haven't done anything for two months, and now you want to come back into the five days a week. I mean, the first thing I'd say is you got to try it. You don't know what it, what it's going to be like. Mm-hmm. You don't know what what point in cycle the training program's at if you're on a group program. Hopefully, if you're working with an individual coach, the coach is knowledgeable enough to know that you've had two months off and you have a slow reintroduction to that. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it, like I said, is experience and how the body and mind is feeling. Yeah, What you have to give that day, no doubt you're going to be more sore than you generally would be. You're definitely going to have more energy to give because you're probably charging to get back into the gym. You just want to go, go, go. And it's just where you got to be smarter and just tailor back and avoid injuries, avoid going too heavy, too early. Uh, avoid too many complex movements too early as well and just build back up the basics. I would like to say that you'd start back as if you're a complete novice for the first week, take the lower end of the rep schemes, take the lower end of the percentages if they're up there, take it as easy as you can while still trying to get a similar stimulus. And then over maybe I'd say two to four weeks, build it back up. I mean, that's, I know that's what we said to a lot of our guys when they got back, when we got uh, back from the lockdown, uh, just, letting people listen you know some people are going to be ready to hit it hard after seven days some people might be taking the full 31 days in a full month to get back to any sort of feeling like they're ready to go so yeah it's, it's totally yeah. individual it depends really nice yeah i think uh, you're right there's so many so many factors now that will depend on on just how hard you hit it but i think your general message there is that well if you understand the concepts of self-regulation then you know there's no there's nothing to say that you can't get back to maybe like a five day week training schedule, but the, the responsibility is on you to make mm-hmm. sensible choices to make sure you're not overcooking it. Yeah. I think I'll just add on top of that then is just as a general rule of thumb is to always start with as little as possible and build from there. And I think, you know, with that, there is no, I can't tell you start with two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, but start with a minimum end like you were saying with the sets and reps, start with the minimum amount of training, monitor how you feel after week one. If you recover optimally, then do it again week two. Now, the time, the question then comes, well, when am I ready to then increase to more training sessions? And my answer always is, well, if you're getting better on less, stay with it for as long as possible. And the moment you feel like you're not improving on, let's say two sessions a week, then you can increase to three. And then when you stick, when you get to three, then you've got to monitor it again. You know, am I improving? Am I getting better here? And if you are, then jump to four. So I just think that approach of like starting with the minimum possible. So the term I think we use in strength conditioning is called minimum recoverable volume. It's something we always yeah. talk about. You're always trying to search for what is the least amount of work I can do to get better. That should always be the goal. Yeah. And then, you know, because if the least amount of work is getting you better, then that's what efficiency is. You're being 100% efficient in what you're doing. The approach that most people take is a reductionist approach, which is I'm going to go all in. And then when I start to get sick, injured and burnt out, I'm going to start to strip away. I'm going to start to strip back and start to reduce my training sessions. And that's obviously yeah. from a longevity standpoint, that's not the smartest way to go about it because you're just running into things like injury, illness, burnout, all that kind of yeah. stuff. And we want to try and avoid that stuff as much as possible. Sure. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, to those of you around the world who are getting back to gyms, pumps for you. Um, I, th- I just think this is going to be such a strange year, but this is probably going to be something that we continue to go through, you know, periods of not having gym access to having gym access, going through these journeys of probably like hitting eight to 12 weeks of really great training with all this amazing equipment to then having to learn to, to still stay on track with our training without it and then bouncing back in. And you know what? I actually don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, you know, just being trying to be somewhat sympathetic here with those people around the world who have had that. What we saw here in our gym is that I think people have been healthier this year than ever before. So they've been forced to take breaks. You know, it's almost kind of like how you would plan as a coach. 
like a really hard training cycle and then a bit of a deloaded training cycle, then a hard training cycle and a deloaded training cycle. And without those deloaded training cycles and, you know, people not having access to the gym, people have actually just been recovering a lot better and then coming into gym and people are hitting, you know, we've had two big lockdowns now, you know, where people have been, hadn't had access to gym for between six to eight weeks at a time and people hitting lifetime prs now like you know more probably than we've ever had before in the past probably just because they've looked after their bodies way better and you had these kind of changes in intensity stimulus and volume over the year so i really don't actually think it's a bad thing for longevity yeah for sure okay last two questions um would you advise training on the day that you start to feel run down or should you avoid it completely? Okay, uh, let me let me pose yeah. a question to you first. Yeah. I think we should define what feeling run down uh, actually means because it can mean a number of different things. So, uh, what I mean, how do people typically feel run down? They feel like they have like a, a cold coming along. Um, they might feel like their body is aching and like feeling heavy or sore. What else might they feel? It could be like, like stomach like a motivation as well. Uh, yeah, no, just a general like, um, yeah, feeling like they just don't have anything yeah. to give. I think it really, like, you know, when it comes to like feeling run down, if we're talking about sickness or illness, you know, that could, illness can be, be uh, uh, it can show itself in a number of different ways. I think typically some of my just general protocols to go to, if it's like, if it's uh, respiratory um, links, so like it's anything to do with breathing. So like, uh, cough, a cold where like you have nasal congestion or like an inability to breathe, then obviously avoiding aerobic conditioning is a smart thing to do. Nothing's going to do it's going to trigger or demand a lot from the respiratory system, but then it might actually be okay to stick to more kind of strength or bodybuilding type protocols. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. Okay. What if someone's got the shits? Cool. Scano had the shits the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you had to pull the pin. Uh, it depends. Again, it depends how you feel and depends if it's a normal thing for you. I know I won't disclose any names, but I know a lot of people have the shits regularly uh, and they actually seem fine to train. Um, it depends if it's affecting you badly, if you're feeling dehydrated, which obviously the shits is massive for. It just completely runs the body dry. Um, generally, again, I would avoid something that puts any more stress on the internal system. So generally, like you said, Hard charging aerobic work is going to be hard on the body. Working to failure like, and strength training, not working a Working towards failure. Yeah. Like you just, again, I, I, I like to ask people to move. Um, and generally I'll tell them to do something they enjoy doing. You know, for some people that is sitting on a C2 bike and just going really easy for 45 to 60 minutes. For some people I know they're not as smart. They'll, like you said, get in the class and they'll try hit the upper range of the percentage and the upper reps and still try and progress. Um, but again, those people are just learning and it's just with experience. But yeah, again, it just it totally, totally depends on what, what, what the issue is and how bad it's affecting their normal day. Yeah, I think the general principle here is that if you're starting to feel run down, the goal has always got to be to get you back to 100%. We need to get you back as quick as possible to be able to push and train hard in your exercise. So if you take that philosophy or that mindset, then every day you're about to train or you're thinking about training, just ask yourself, is this training going to move me closer to being hundred percent or is it going to push me further away? Yeah. Uh, and truth be told, if it's the first time you're getting sick in training, you're not going to know a lot of this stuff just has to be trial and error. And every time you do get sick, it's probably going to be a very unique, different situation to the previous time you got sick. Uh, but again, yeah. taking that, what we just talked about doing as little as possible and seeing and monitoring how you feel versus going all in realizing you did too much and then having to be forced into rest for a few days is not the way to go about it. So I, yeah. I agree. I typically always feel better when I move, um, when I'm sick or when I'm getting run down, sometimes actually taking complete rest makes me feel worse. Um, so, you know, just as long as you're adhering to the general protocols of like, you're not creating more inflammation in your body. If it's something gut related, remember that like, you know, the immune system is hundred percent linked to the gut. So the more stress you put on your digestive system and your gut um, through hard training, it's only going to push you back further. And yeah, you know, and also just be mindful of other people. If you're sick, stop, don't come to the gym and bring that shit on everyone else. Yeah. 
I guess, I guess the other side of being run down is, you know, people can start feeling like niggly injuries and stuff like that as well. Um, I think if it's, you know, if it's just an, un, un, yeah, or like your number one, Mr. Glass over there, but you know, if it's just an unfortunate injury where you caught a clean wrong and your wrist is, is bung and it's going to be out of commission for a couple of weeks, then of course you can adapt your training around that. Yes. You're going to be a bit sad, but adapt your training, be smart to still get a similar stimulus to what, is required of you normally on those days uh, but like you said if it's like a uh, an actual sickness or you know you're getting run down then it's just got to be smart on that as well yeah i completely agree just making adjustments to the training session uh so you get a similar stimulus super important for example if your knees are hurting and you're back squats squat to a box so where you're taking out the depth yeah. um you know you've got heavy deadlifts programmed um but your back's hurting move to a GHD and do some glute ham raises or some Sorensons. Your wrist is hurting. Don't use a barbell, use dumbbells. There's always yeah. a way to work around an issue to hit the similar muscle group without triggering more pain. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, nice. Last question. I'm programming for myself. How do I know when it's time to change a variable? For example, how do I know when it's time to change exercise sets and reps? Uh, I think you already mentioned it, actually, the uh, MRV, the minimum recoverable um, in terms of how much you want to be doing. We want to do as little as possible, whether you're the athlete or whether you're the coach. You don't want to be programming A through to like H for a, for a client, even if it still takes them an hour. You want to do the least amount of work so that they can still be successful with whatever else they do in, in, in their life. Um, similarly, like you said as well, if whatever stimulus you're in, let's take a back squat and let's say you're doing four sets of eight, right? And if it's still improving and you're still adding more load to the bar week on week on week, there's absolutely no need to change. Okay, there's no need there. to change. Hold that because that's it's that's a perfect answer. But okay, so what are, what are we led to believe as people who program for ourselves? We're led to believe that our rep scheme should Typically, like if we're trying to get stronger, we should see our rep scheme decreasing. Week one, do 10 reps. Week two, do eight reps. Week three, do six reps. Week four, do four reps. And yeah. then probably we change the exercise to something else. What yeah. you're just saying there is that if you're still able to add something, get more out of the same rep scheme, the same exercise, there's no need to change it. Yeah. Well, again, depending. I mean, if you're a power lifter, you're going to be back scoring, bench pressing and deadlifting for your entire life. If you're doing, the, the, and I guess this is where it kind of comes in, where you got like a sport like CrossFit, when there's so many different movements, it depends on what you're trying to do. No, but let's let's take the back squat again. Like again, you just you just want to do as little as possible. The more you're having a change up and movement, let's say you're going from a back squat, then you suddenly switch to a front squat, and you haven't front squatted for four weeks. The first two weeks, your body is probably going to be in used to slightly different positions. It has to change up a little bit. Suddenly, you feel like you're not progressing. You need to change the movement again. Mm. You're then going to go to a leg press or a hack squat or whatever it might be. Oh, these are going to get my legs stronger. Oh, I didn't really get any results there. Let's move on to this. Like you have to stick with something to start with, probably anywhere between three to six weeks, three to eight weeks, to see some sort of change. And if it's still progressing, like we said before, then just stick with it and just keep yeah. going with it. I think it's important to note that generally the more experienced of a weight trainee you are, probably the more variance you need to add yeah. into a program. The least, the less experience you are, the less variance you need. And when we're talking about more experience, I'm literally talking about 10 plus years of consistent, structured, progressive training. I don't mean just, you know, attending body pump class and doing spin for 10 years. That's not, that's not what I would deem to be an experienced weight trainee. So I think that's something that's really important. But I mean, like something I've, you know, we've, we've been exposed to these principles, you know, even in our rugby days where we would have our programs written for us. But I mean, I, I really like some of these points only really hit home to me this year, you know, after I picked up a few injuries, uh, my wrist notably, and I got basically I had a, a much uh, less broad selection of exercises to choose from because there's only certain ones that I could do. So I ended up for almost, you know, more than 12 weeks just sticking with the same exercise and it made me realize it brought me back to the importance, the fundamentals that unless you are no longer progressing with a rep scheme, a set scheme and an exercise, there is absolutely no way to change it. So kind of let's illustrate that to someone. Okay. Let's say you have an exercise and let's just say it's the back squat. 
I think some guiding principles that you always have to remember is that we always want to lift with perfect form. So that is a variable we can't change because sloppy repetitions just don't do shit. They, 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 they one, put us at risk of injury. Number two, they're not developing or building the muscles that we actually want to build. All right. So lifting with poor form is just never, ever, ever really an option. If you're a competitive athlete and you're competing, okay, that's different because you're going as fast as you can or as hard as you can. But for those who are training for health and longevity, just remove the possibility of, of crappy technique out of your vocabulary, out of your head. Number one. So number two is, okay, the next question is week two. You've got the same rep scheme on the same exercise. You're squatting again. Option one is, can I add more load to the bar? Now, a lot of us get stuck into the thinking that if I want to add more load, I have to add a 2.5 minimum to either side of the barbell. And then if I want to go up from 2.5, I need to put a five on either side. When an increase could be 0.5 kilograms or one kilogram, we get so afraid. And I still do this sometimes. You know, I get this habit of just jumping up in 2.5s or fives. Now, let's be honest, I never jump up in fives, but I jump up in 2.5s where really, you know, even putting an extra kilogram on the bar is still progress. And I think especially, number, especially across like four sets, for example, especially across four sets, it adds up yeah. to total, total volume lifted. And yeah. so, you know, step one is, well, can you add more weights to bar at the same rep scheme? I think 99% of the time for most people listening to this podcast, yes, you can probably add some more load to the bar. Obviously, if the more load you have on the bar, the bigger your jumps, the less load you have on the bar, let's say something like a strict press, especially if I'm strict pressing, the smaller your jumps. Okay. Next thing, okay, well, what if you can't or you don't want to put any more weight on the bar? What could you do? Well, you could do an extra repetition. So, you know, doing nine reps at 100 kilograms versus eight reps at 100 kilograms is still an improvement in strength. So you've got two variables you can play with straight away there, adding more load or adding more repetitions to the bar. And I think uh, when you get to a point where you really can't, You've exhausted all your options or maybe like a dumbbell weight is just jumping up too much. You just can't do it. That is then the time to look at making a change in terms of the selection of perhaps exercise or changing the sets or changing the repetitions. Yeah. And I think as general, you know, the last thing there is like, you'll be surprised as to how long you can make these things drag out for and still get fantastic progress with them. Probably yeah. the biggest thing that, that kills us is just, do you this need? idea that we want a lot of variance and we get yeah. bored of the things that we do and therefore we need to change it up. For sure. Anything to add on there, Ant? No, keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Okay, cool. Guys, well, there's your six questions. And appreciate your time once again. Thank you very uh, much. Thank for you for sharing me. your thoughts on training. Uh, guys, you've written in questions. I mean, I would thank you, but I really went back to the archives there. So some of these questions came in over a year ago. So if you did write in a year ago, thank you very much for your, for your question. It uh, provided for some good conversation on this podcast. All right, everyone. Well, that's enough from us. It's 8.33. That's three minutes past bedtime for me. And what are you doing now? Uh, I need to eat my last meal of the day, which is sitting in front of me. I've patiently left it there for the last hour and a half. Well done. Uh, well, you got some then I'm going to bed. No, I've got uh, some beef and onion. And then I'm going to bed. And I've got to go swimming tomorrow morning. Lovely. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye-bye.